Hello. Uh, so I just want to call out, um, we've set up a GitHub page. Um, so if you want to contribute, you'd like to speak, or if you have a specific topic that you'd like us to cover, go there. There's a README page to get you started. Um, and we're actually using the issues section of the GitHub page to um, submit talk ideas. So if you have one you'd like to present, go ahead and submit an issue. If you've just got an idea, submit an issue. And then um, feel free to come and vote on issues. Just give it a plus one or a thumbs up. So that's all of the announcements I have. Thanks for coming again. And uh, we'll get started. Hello? Okay, can you guys hear me all right? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so my talk is Architecture and Layout the Easy Way. Um, so just a little, about, little bit about me before I get too into things. Uh, this is kind of my experience here. Uh, I recently graduated from USU in computer science, um, and I've been into web development heavily for about three plus years. Um, and then within that three years, I worked, for the past two years, I worked with this company called Lightning Kite up in Logan. Uh, this company was, or what they do is it's more of a client work, so a lot of companies will come to us and they'll want an app built or a website built and we would meet with them and build it for them. And it's cool because some of their clients are uh, Intel, uh, Blizzard, PetSmart, uh, TaxBot, um, a lot of, there's a lot of companies that are all around the nation, and um, they've made a pretty good name for themselves so far. And some of the main technologies we used there were Django, Node, and Angular. And so this is where I learned a lot of my Angular. I uh, was working here at this company, and a lot of the stuff I'll talk about was influenced because of this, uh, the company I worked for. <clears throat> so what I want to cover today is... Um, a lot of us go to Egghead.io or search YouTube and we, we see a lot of tutorials. And these tutorials are short and we learn how to hook up a directive or a user controller or all these, all these little topics. Um, and they're all pretty scattered, but you, you can kind of grasp all the topics and bring them, put them together and use them in an app or in production. Uh, but one thing that I struggled with and that I think a lot of people struggle with is actually taking all those little concepts that you learn and putting them into an app that, that can be production ready or that they actually use tools to help build your app so that you're not doing a lot of the mundane stuff that, that you do with these tutorials because a lot of them will either um, create an index.html file and then create a JavaScript file and then you manually uh, import that into your index file. You just source app.js. Um, and then you'll go to uh, find a, the CDN to all the libraries that you're going to use and put them into index. And it's a lot of tedious work that, um, truth is, a lot of people don't even do anymore because we have automated tools that do that for us. Um, and so I want to 
help those people out there that are struggling with actually creating production-ready apps be able to take all those things that they've been learning and put them into a production app. Um, and if you already do that on a daily basis, then hopefully we can kind of collaborate and hopefully you get some good ideas from me and hopefully you guys will give me feedback if you think I do something that's not the best way. Uh, let me know. I'm all ears. Uh, and I just want to walk through all the tools that we use and the layouts that we've used at Lightning Kite. Um, there's some times where we'd have to be putting sites out uh, two or three within a couple weeks span. And if we had to start from the ground up every single time, uh, we would be kind of uh, screwed because those, it takes a lot of time to set up things. So what we did was we scoured the internet, scoured all over the place for scaffolds and tried to come up with the best way that worked for us. And so this works for us. Hopefully it can work for you or take, take, the, uh, take some practices and apply it to your current development. And just remember, this is opinionated. And give me your feedback. I'm, I'm all ears to learn something new. <clears throat> so like I said, why would we use a scaffold is this allows us to get up and running quickly, takes out all that boring stuff, setting up your index file, setting up you know, SAS or less or whatever you happen to use, and gets all that out of the way so you can get to coding. So in this scaffold, we use Grunt, SAS, and Angular, and um, Bower, some other tools. Uh, these are the three main things that I really want to cover. Um, so first of all, why we chose to use Grunt, there's a lot of uh, JavaScript task runners out there. Um, there's Gulp. Uh, you can run Node scripts. There's uh, Webpack, which has become pretty popular. Uh, but we chose Grunt because it allows us to do everything. So it runs our tests, compiles our JavaScript files for us, uh, compiles our SAS for us. Uh, we can watch our code. We can minify our code for production and do a lot of, a lot of cool things with Grunt. Um, and so why we chose to use SAS in this uh, scaffold is because nowadays, it's a good idea to use a uh, preprocessor because if you're like me, when I was learning CSS, I hated it. This like CSS is awesome. Like that was the story of my life. Like I sucked trying to get stuff to work, so I kind of just always got my buddy to do my CSS for me. He taught me SAS, and like life became a little better. Um, and SAS is also fast now. It seems like it's becoming more of an industry standard because now we have Node SAS, so we don't have to install Ruby just to compile your SAS for you which is very nice. And Angular, which is why we're here. So <clears throat> let's take a look at the scaffold. So I sent out the link to the scaffold on Meetup, so hopefully you guys got it. Um, if you're following along, it's uh, my GitHub is rustmax783, and Angular scaffold's on there. I don't have too many repos. But, so this is the main overall directory and structure. So I've crossed out in red the things that you don't even need to worry about. Uh, the first file is Karma, and it just contains one file right now, which is just set up to run Karma, or our unit tests. Um, yeah, if you're trying to learn unit testing, it's just dig into unit testing. Don't worry about trying to set it up, because sometimes testing is hard enough as it is for, for learners. Um, the source we'll come back to, because this is going to be the main part of our app. The editor config. Hopefully a lot of you guys use editor config because it has saved our life because um, we'd work on in big groups. And if, if I had my browser and I have my styles and my buddy has his or coworker, um, it's nice to have all your code formatted the same way. So your JavaScript files formatted the same way, Python files, any file you work with, have it formatted the same way. And it really saves a lot of headache because Everything is the way you like it. And you can come to an agreement within your organization. Um, just go to editorconfig.org, and you can learn more about that. Um, the git ignore, so this is pretty important, because within this app, when we build and compile and npm install, bower install, we're going to get a lot of files. And in here, we just ignore, ignore those files, because we don't need to store those on our GitHub repo. Um, the README, uh, I've tried to be really in depth in the README. So if you ever, if you end up using this, which I hope some of you guys do, um, see that and hopefully it walks you through some steps. If you encounter a step that I may miss, just submit me, submit it to me and I can put it in there. 
And then the Bower and pa Bower.json and the Packers.json. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's where we're going to put uh, dependencies for our app. And so, let's see. In our Bower.json is where we're going to put uh, things like Angular, Angular UI Router, um, Angular Mocks, and Lodash. So these are the four main things that we've used in every single app. Let's get rid of this. Um, if you guys don't want to use Lodash, just go ahead and take it out. But we've used it all the time. And then your package.json, which is going to be all of our dependencies for like Grunt and for Karma and all testing stuff. So this is a pretty boilerplate right here. Um, and if you clone this, I just barely cloned this. I npm installed and I bower installed before, just in case anything went wrong. Um, but you should be able to get up and running right now. And I'll show you what it looks like. And again, excuse my CSS skills because they are not the best. But hopefully gets the point across. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's a basic app that usually <clears throat> all of our apps started out with a home page, a login screen, header, and a footer. Um, we can switch between the pages. Login doesn't work. We haven't hooked this up because usually it was different with every app. And sometimes we didn't even use a login screen. So now let's actually dig into that source file. So our source file, this is where all of our code that we are going to write, all of our Angular code, um, all of our assets, it's going to live in our source file. Um, so the first directory is our app directory. Uh, this is our main, all of our apps, all of our little, uh, the sections of our, of our site. And in here you can see that there is the authentication and the home directory. And inside of those directories, we put all of our JavaScript files, our template files, and our tests. Um, and I, I'm going to go through the naming convention in just a sec. But there is, I mean, that's, that's what our app is for. This is, this is, that's going to be the main part that you'll be working with. Assets, that's just any images that you're going to include. Now, the common file, uh, why we have this file is because sometimes there's Angular components that you're going to use across your whole site. Things like filters or some directives like a, a time picker directive. And we didn't want to put that inside of the app and try and create just an app for it when it's not really a specific uh, app, if that makes sense. Uh, so our common, a good example would be in our common directory, we would put a filters directory. And then inside that filters directory, we would create a filter for whatever it does. So if it's formatting time or um, whatever else you need to filter, then you'd put your JavaScript files in there and then your test files in there. And then everything is compartmentalized. So you can locate it very easily and very quickly. And someone else coming into your app doesn't have to dig through a lot of files. They just they are able to go to the, the files that they really need. And then our SAS, that's where our SAS file is going to go, and our index. OK, so to get off off the ground and running with HTML and SAS. Here, uh, a lot of this HTML, I took, I took a, a boilerplate that another one of my buddies made at Lightning Kite, and I put it into the scaffold because it was really good. It created a header at the top, pushed the footer to the bottom. If any of you have tried to make a footer and position it at the very bottom of the screen all the time, it's kind of a pain in the butt. And so he was able to create this scaffold and inside of his SAS files. Uh, he has some helper functions, which are very useful, and which we ended up using in most all of our, or he ended up using in most of all of, all of his uh, mockups, all of the sites we've used, and some variables. And even if you don't use these, if you're not very familiar with SAS, it'll help you kind of learn SAS quickly without having to go through the docs over and over and over again. And um, so I'll let you guys mess with SAS since this is an Angular meetup. 
Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Does anybody know how to enlarge the sidebar? I've never done that before. Is that what you need to see is the sidebar or kind of the navigation? Whoops. Yeah. Sorry. Bear with me here. Um, so a lot of it's pretty self-explanatory. Looking at it at a glance, hopefully. Um, I mean, if you guys have any questions, please uh, let me know. So, so there's our, our source file. We have those four directories and our index.html. Um, if you need to modify the index.html to fit your needs, like you don't have a footer, then go ahead and get rid of that. Um, so now, let's actually get into where things are going to be useful for most of you guys in 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 development. So, let's say let's not get that. Okay, so say we want to use Moment.js in our app. Um, so many of us, when we're first learning, will go find the CDN and include it right into our app. Um, and for development, sometimes it's not the best case. So what we could do is uh, we use Bower. Um, and so all we have to do is inside, so right here where I'm at, I'll make this bigger for you guys. So this is the directory uh, that I just cloned. I ran npm install and bower install. And so bower is going to go and get a uh, library that we want. And so we can go bower search moment.js. And so here's some of the results that come up with moment.js. And we see right there at the top. So we can go bower install moment.js dash dash save. And that save is going to add it to or bower.json. Right there. So you can see it added moment.js. Um, and that's really nice, because then if you forget to use the dash dash save and you push up to GitHub and then another coworker pulls it down, and then he runs it and then app breaks because it can't find moment, then it becomes a problem. I mean, usually it's easy to tell because it says moment JS not found, but uh, this helps to be able to keep everyone's development environment the same. So now one thing here with this scaffold is we can't just install it. So we need to go and go to our Bower, our build config, and all you got to worry about is down at the very bottom um, where it says vendor files. So we'll look at our vendor directory. This is where all of those dependencies go. Look at moment.js. And we find here's moment.js right there. So inside of our build config, all we need to do is add that path. And the order here it does matter. So say, so low dash is going to be included above Angular. Angular is going to be included above Angular UI router. And now vendor slash moment.js slash mo and now moment's going to be included last. And so that's that's the pretty simple way of how how we can now just include all these third party libraries that we're going to use that you want to use. So now, I want to go into the actual grunt uh, aspect of, of our development. So like I said, a lot of times we'll, in, when starting out, we'll just include everything manually into our index file. Well, if you'll notice, our index file actually just looks like this. So there's, we don't have all of those script tags, including every single JavaScript file we have. Um, this is just the template that we're going to use to be able to um, get all of our dependencies, all of our JavaScript files, all of our templates, then put them into here. So grunt, we have a couple commands 
that we've created. And so here they are. So we have, if you just run grunt, it's just going to build. It's the same as grunt build. Then there's grunt quick build, which is going to build but not test. Grunt test is going to run the test but not build. Grunt watch is going to build, but it keeps our test server running so it doesn't have to spin that up every time because that's the slowest part. And it'll keep that running, and it'll watch any file that we change and then uh, rebuild it, but just that file that changed. And then grunt compile is what's going to minify all of our code for production and then put it into a, a bin file. And that's what we can put up on our production sites. And we have one JavaScript file, one CSS file. And, um, and that works out. That's worked out really great. So now I'll show you if we run grunt build. Builds, it ran our test. You can see executed seven of seven tests. And then inside of our build directory, so this is where all of our all of our code's going to get put. It kind of looks the same as our source directory because build doesn't minify because this is what you're going to use during development. So you need to be able to open up a file in a browser and, and modify it and play with it if you have errors or uh, for whatever case. So now you can see our index file actually has all those scripts now. So it took care of this for us. Uh, we don't have to go through and try and include all all of our Angular, all of all every single JS file that we create, because if you can imagine, say we have an app with like with 30 different pages or 30 different little 30 subsections. I mean, you're going to have like 60 script tags there, and trying to manage those on your own is going to be a nightmare. Um, and so you can see it's also included a CSS, vendor files, and everything. So what happened was in our source file our source directory, Grunt went through and it grabbed all the JS files. Um, excuse me, not all JS files. It doesn't include the .spec.js or .e2e.js because those are our test files. So it grabs all the ones that just end in .js and puts them into here for us. And I believe it goes alphabetically. Um, and so that, let's see. So that saves a lot of time because we don't have to do that manually, and I love that. Um, and so now you see our source file. It's going to look pretty much the exact same. We have app authentication. So here's auth token JS. Um, this right here, though, so you'll notice the template files aren't there anymore because those got built and uh, put into a, a JavaScript file that is used to then include all the templates in into um, that that your particular JavaScript files are going to depend on. Um, and so that just helps speed things up really fast. So, so that's our, our build our build directory when we run grunt build. So now let's say we're in development and we want to change a couple things. So if I run grunt watch, like I said before, it's going to run grunt build just as normal. And then it ran our tests. But now it's waiting. Our Phantom JS server, that's up and running. That's just kind of sitting in the background waiting. And what it's doing is just watching for any changes that we make inside of our source file. So now let's go into home and say, oh, we want to change the title to something different. So I go to home. It says, welcome to the home page. So now we can come here and sell a welcome to my site. So I'll save it. You can see it already ran it. It's really quick. Um, it says done without errors, already ran our tests. And then we can refresh. And you can even actually, what's even cooler, is you can install a plugin that will watch. Sometimes I can never tell if it's on. There you go. Enable live reload. So now it's on. Now if I shrink this down so you can see everything run. Welcome to the home page. We save that. Runs runs that build, but it only built uh, home.js. And then 
instant reload. Let's see, what's this plugin called? Live reload. Uh, just instantly detects those changes and then refreshes the page. And so that's that helps speed up development because once we got all this stuff up, st all this stuff up and running, our development times just went through the roof. We um, waiting for switching over to grunt grunt build, and then fi like finding an error. And you'll notice usually my terminal it beeps if there's a, a test that goes wrong. Uh, so if we if we just show a test that is wrong. <clears throat> runs and then it goes. It does a little beep, and then um, says, "Oh, you got a warning because your test failed." So now we can fix those tests. Oh my goodness! And life is good. And so, uh, one of the key things that we decided in determining on how to build our Angular applications was. Each of these directories, so I mean, there's many ways that you can structure your apps. There's no specific way as long as they exist, as long as your JavaScript files exist and you include them in the right place, um, your Angular app's going to work. But if you just kind of throw everything out there, um, someone else is going to come look at your code and immediately walk away because good code is my friend and it's your guys' friend too. And so what we decided was inside our app, we're going to compartmentalize all of our, all of our, uh, all the sections of our page. So you can see here, our home page is going to have home JS. We have so here's where the controller lives. If we have a directive, we create a JavaScript file for the directive. Um, we have our spec file, which any dot spec dot JS is going to be our unit tests. Then we have our TPL file, so home dot TPL dot HTML. That's all of our, our HTML templates that's going to be included. And so if I know that I'm going to be working on the home page, I can go to app, home, and there I have everything. And that has worked really well for us. Um, I've seen a lot of other people kind of have a controllers file, and they have all these JS files with each controller uh, JavaScript file that they have, and then all the template file and all the templates they have. And the problem there that we don't we didn't like was if you need to work on the home page, you have to go to that directory, your controllers directory, find the home.js file, go to the templates directory, find the home.tpl file. Um, if there's other filters or whatever else is the case, you got to go to all those files and find them. And so we shied away from that pretty quickly with some of the other scaffolds that we saw that did that. Um, and so now when I'll close up here. Um, but when you're doing those tutorials that you see on Egghead or YouTube or whatever other sites are out there, there's a ton of them now, um, you can create a little folder. Folder. So say you're testing how to do this cool directive that you saw. You can create a folder, name it something, put all the files that are in there, and run grunt build, and it's going to build everything for you. Um, and you don't have to manually include uh, the, the source files into your index file and hopefully that speeds up a lot of your guys' development time and even learning because um, you can keep a lot of a lot of the things that you've learned in the same in the same uh, app so that way when you want to use it you can go right to it and and see a working example for it so just a couple gotchas really quick uh, when you add a new file and you're running grunt watch, you need to run grunt. You need to kill it and run it again because it's only watching the files that are there. When, edi when editing <clears throat> index.html, for some reason right now you have to kill it and do it again because it doesn't get watched. Um, and with SAS, just make sure you import all of all of your other SAS files that you'll create into your main SAS file, and it will make your life a lot easier. Um, and then at the end of this, I'll put slides online. But at the end of this, these are all the uh, most of the uh, links that that we got a lot of our information from, and let's say I think that's it. But um, I would just like to stress the importance of of creating a structured guide for yourself, or if you're in a team environment, create a, a team style guide, because sharing code can sometimes get messy, 
And when you create a, stru a structure guide or a something structured, then it will make your life and development a lot easier because everyone's on the same page. If I go look at my buddy's code, it should look similar to mine, if not the same, of how I would do it. And you kind of come to agreements, and that's what we did at Lightning Kite, and it helped us immensely. So hopefully, hopefully this helps you guys. Um, go check it out. You can run it with any any backend. Uh, we ran it with Django. You can also just run HTTP server for development for just testing and playing around with stuff. And I hope you guys like it and let me know your thoughts and feelings about it. So thanks. <laughs> Unfortunately, the bulb in this projector is burned out. So if you want, you're welcome to pull your chairs around here. If you want to get a better uh, view of the screen, feel free to just gather around. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay. Let us go ahead and get started. You guys can hear that too, right? Cool, Thanks. perfect. All right, I think we're ready to go then. Oops. All right, All right I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Joe Skeen, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about TypeScript and Angular. Um, so all of you here have some experience with Angular, I'm assuming. Um, how many of you have played around with TypeScript at all, or at least know about TypeScript, or what it is? Cool. All right. So uh, about a month ago, I gave a talk at Open West Conference um, about TypeScript and Angular. This is kind of a compressed version of that, so uh, I hope it doesn't feel too rushed, but I'm cramming a lot into a small amount of time. My goal here is to be able to give you guys an idea of what TypeScript is and how it can help you guys in your Angular applications and how to get started. So just a little bit about myself. My name's Joe Skeen. Um, I've been programming for most of my life, ever since I was about eight years old. I started playing around with my dad's development tools, and one thing led to another, and I started teaching myself all kinds of uh, languages. I graduated from Newmont University back in 2011, and I currently work at Intermountain Healthcare as a software engineer. Um, so what is TypeScript? The simplest definition of it is a, a superset of JavaScript that compiles down to plain JavaScript. Um, it also adds optional static typing, and features from the future. So that means ECMAScript 6. Some of the ECMAScript 7 proposals are things that you can use in TypeScript. So why do we want to go with TypeScript? Well, one of the reasons is that when you get JavaScript projects that start to grow, it gets really hard to manage them. Just kind of like this uh, little puppy here that is actually one of my coworkers, um, when it grew up, it got to be much, much bigger and very, it, it's quite a different animal at that point, no pun intended. Um, and a lot of us, as we're writing, you know, 
tens of thousands of lines of JavaScript code, JavaScript's a great language, and it, the dynamic nature of it is very powerful, but it can also shoot you in the foot. Once you get that much code, it's really hard to rename things, like you know, if you want to rename a field called ID on something to something else, and it's scattered all throughout your code, you don't want to break everything. So TypeScript allows you to manage big projects. Now, I just wanted to share with you guys a little clip from the Microsoft Build Conference uh, about a month ago. Um, a couple of the guys from the Angular team, you may have heard of them, Mishko and Brad Green, came and talked about uh, why they decided to go with TypeScript for Angular 2. So we'll just play that real quick. As I remember, not too long ago, you weren't actually that big of a fan of types in JavaScript, right? That's true. You know, it's funny because I come from a Java background, and there's plenty of types in Java. And I went to move to JavaScript. It turns out I was able to build application without types. And so I thought, you know, this type stuff was kind of overrated, and who needs them anyways? But it turns out as the team grew and it got larger and we got more contributors, it kind of actually became useful to have types around. Yeah, well, tell folks why is that. So there's several reasons why that is. First of all, documentation. You know, types gives you names for things. You have a common vocabulary, common mental model, and just being able to refer to things is just a win-win for everybody. Uh, the next thing is when you're building an application with a framework, there's a lot of contract between a framework and what you have to do with the application. Having some kind of a tool, a compiler, to verify these contracts is very useful. Uh, lastly, we're big uh, fans of writing unit tests, uh, and we write tests first and doing it everywhere. But we found that even with lots of due diligence and testing, we still found that type system would help find many issues that we didn't notice. And then the last point is having an IDE that can help us with completion and getting around the code and just finding out where things are declared is super useful. And this is extra useful for bringing people who are new to the project on board. That, that's a really quick um, statement about TypeScript, but I think it was it pointed out all the things that I want to say. So let's move on to uh, some of the other things that you can do with TypeScript. So as of today with ECMAScript 5, you don't have a whole lot of object-oriented concepts. And for people who have come from object-oriented languages, um, TypeScript allows them to use a lot of these features that are coming in ECMAScript 6, uh, including modules, classes, arrow functions, and so forth. Um, but the cool thing about it is it you can, when you're compiling your TypeScript down to JavaScript, you can choose which version of ECMAScript you want to output. So you can output ECMAScript 3 or 5 or 6. Um, so it will work on any browser. They don't have to install any plugins or any silly stuff like that. Another cool thing about TypeScript is it has a very low barrier to entry. Since it is a superset of ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 6 JavaScript, you can take this and we're going to transform it into TypeScript. The same thing. Anything that's valid JavaScript is also valid TypeScript, which means you don't have to go and rewrite your code. There are some other solutions out there, like CoffeeScript and Dart, which uh, aim at fixing a similar problem, um, but you have to rewrite your code in order to do that. Java, uh, TypeScript allows you to start with your existing JavaScript and add things on an opt-in basis as you feel comfortable. Um, when you have static types, which are optional in TypeScript, it allows your tools to help you um, more and more. So you get some intelligent autocompletion. You get refactoring support, including renaming. Um, it allows for code analysis, navigation, finding all references, things that are kind of hard for tools to do when they don't know what different things are. Like, again, if you're looking for the symbol ID, how does it know where that ID is the same as not another ID? Also, TypeScript has some great support for lots of different tools. Um, and I think this is an incomplete list. But with the new version of TypeScript that's coming out soon, it's uh, currently in beta, they're actually releasing a language service that will allow you, it, it runs on Node, so it works on any platform, and it'll allow any editor to tap into this, so this can grow even more. 
But I mean, you don't even have to use an IDE or a fancy code editor. You can use, I've used Nano to edit TypeScript files. I don't recommend that very much because it's kind of cumbersome compared to some of these other tools. But uh, TypeScript can be used with any editor you want. And also, um, as we kind of alluded to, the Angular team has decided to get rid of their own language at script and move to TypeScript. So that's another great reason to use TypeScript, especially when you're using an Angular project. Um, Angular 2.0 will be developed in TypeScript, but you can even use uh, Angular 1.4 or 1.3 or whatever version you're on with TypeScript as well, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So TypeScript was uh, created by Microsoft as an open source project back in 2012. Since then, a lot of other uh, people throughout the industry have rallied around it and have contributed to it and are using it. Um, if you look out on GitHub, there's quite a few repositories that are using TypeScript. Um, so that's a really good indicator as to the health of that community. Also, we have something that's called Definitely Typed, which allows you to um, get type definitions that are written in TypeScript that will describe the APIs of the frameworks that you're using, for instance, Angular, as well as a lot of others. And we'll show you a little bit about how that magic can light up your code and give you really great auto completion as you're coding. OK, so with that, I'm going to hop over to a demo. Um, if you guys want to, you can go out to typescriptlang.org. And there's this little feature out here called the playground. Oh, and it looks like it's not going to work for me. Let's, OK. OK, that's fine. I can just hop out here myself. <laughs> so at typescriptlang.org, there's a play link that will load up the TypeScript playground. And this is basically just a, a JavaScript editor here. On the left, you can type in TypeScript. And on the right, it'll show you what the output JavaScript would look like. And for this example, I'm doing very little with TypeScript. In fact, the only thing that is TypeScript specific is this default parameter here. So everything else should look the same on the right as it does on the left. Um, I want to show you just a little bit about how TypeScript works and how you should look at it and expect to see things. So have any of you guys used ActionScript before? Not too many. Um, have any of you used Pascal? OK, so those are languages that have types declared after the variables. And that's the, the pattern that they use in TypeScript. So you'll have the variable, so it'll be like var, my var, and then you'll declare the type after it. Now, you don't have to declare a type on everything. Again, it's all opt-in, just so that you can get better tooling support. Um, but when you have the colon and then a type, you just know that that's what type it is. Um, for parameters, same thing, just colon after. And then if you want to have like a callback type, um, you can declare that it's going to be a function that takes a callback parameter of some type and returns a callback func return type. Um, TypeScript uses all the basic types that already exist in JavaScript. Now, you might be saying, whoa, 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 there's no types in JavaScript. Well, there actually is, but you don't have to deal with them um, unless you end up with weird situations where things are not uh, being converted properly. But JavaScript includes booleans, numbers, strings, arrays, dates. Um, and TypeScript take, takes these built-in JavaScript types and exposes them through your code and so that you can get better tooling support. So if you go ahead and just assign a variable, it will automatically, through type inference, know what type it is. So here we've got this variable fur that it knows is of type string. And so if you go and try to assign it to true, it's going to say, wait a minute, that's supposed to be a string. So that can save you a lot of trouble if you accidentally assign the wrong value to something. Um, also, we have 
furry param is declared up here, and it has a default value of true. And so through type inference, I'm assigning a variable here, and it knows it's a Boolean because this is a Boolean. So again, we can do all that. Um, another cool thing about TypeScript is, uh, as I was going to mention, is that through the definitely typed files, the .d.ts files, um, they really des describe all of the, the APIs which you work with on a daily basis. And you'll see here that hairs is of type string. And we get all this information on the split method, including what parameters it expects, the overloads, some documentation on it. If we take a look at, well, let's see if I can pull up this one. I can't find my mouse cursor. Where are we? OK. But um, let's just open up one of these files, and I can find it from there. So we get this, in, uh, this completion here. And if we right click on it, we can say peak definition or go to definition. OK. Doesn't want to help me here. The demo is not with me today. <laughs> but uh, what that usually pulls up is a file called lib.d.ts, which has about 16,000 lines of code in it that describe the entire base JavaScript library, as well as DOM manipulation. And it has all of this so that it can be pulled into your editor to help you out. So those are the 16,000 lines of code that you're supposed to know as a JavaScript developer by heart. And uh, I'm really glad that the tools can help us out with that. So coming up over here, we've got um, we're signing a date, and it knows about the set hours, and so forth. Um, we're kind of running low on time, so I'm going to skip through the rest of that stuff and go to the real example. So I have a cloned, or forked, rather, um, John Papa's ng demos repository that uh, he uses in his Pluralsight course, AngularJS Patterns and Practices. Um, and I've made some modifications to it to show you how easy it is to start using TypeScript in an existing Angular uh, JavaScript project. So first of all, I just wanted to make a little note about the, the controller here that you see. This is the dashboard. And right here, it's using scope to wire up everything. Um, there, this is perfectly jo uh, valid JavaScript and perfectly valid Angular uh, code. However, I really prefer to use the controller as syntax. And it makes it a whole lot easier, especially when you're using TypeScript, to be using controller as. So I just wanted to show you that um, so you wouldn't freak out when you see this. This is using controller as, um, where you define a function and then you do this dot instead of doing scope dot. Um, and this is a future-proof way of uh, writing your code because Angular 2 will no longer be using scope. Everything will be more towards this pattern. Um, so this is our comics controller. And we can see really quickly here what this looks like. OK. so. Wow, OK. All right, I'm just not having a good time with the demos tonight. But anyway, we can go to this comics here. And this allows us to filter out these Marvel comics by name. So we could do Dare, and it pulls up Daredevil. Um, and then there's the Avengers, and then there's the dashboard. So this is the, this is the original here. Um, and then in order to use TypeScript, all we have to do is uh, rename our .js to .ts. And then now it's a TypeScript file. Um, now, you can't run TypeScript because 
it needs to be compiled to JavaScript first. So there's a tool called TSC, which comes with the TypeScript development, uh, which stands for TypeScript compiler, that will allow you to compile it down to JavaScript. Um, let's see here. Please. Yeah, we'll do comics. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to convert it into an ECMAScript 6 class using TypeScript just to show you how easily this can be done. So um, first of all, we're going to replace the word function with class, since we can use a class here. And then we're going to take these parameters off of here, and we're going to define a constructor. And there's our parameters for our constructor. Now, things that are just hanging out inside this function here can be moved up into the constructor. And then we don't need var vm equals this anymore, so we can go ahead and remove that. Class variables don't need to have a this dot in front of them. Um, the default access modifier is public for uh, TypeScript and ECMAScript classes. But when you're doing methods, you just take off the function keyword. And now they're class functions. Now you'll notice that it's not very happy right now. So we've got a problem with activate. All we need to do here is say this dot activate. And then here this dot logger dot info. This dot get comics. This dot data service. And then this dot comics. This dot comics. OK, the other thing we need to do is it's complaining about data service. So we need to create a variable for that. So there's two ways you can do that. And I'll show you this way first. So we can either, in here, we can say this dot data service equals data service. And that will assign it to the private variable there. But I like to do it this way instead. You can just go in here and say private. And it will automatically wire that up for you. So you don't have to worry about that. OK, so we should be mostly happy now. Um, a couple of other things we'll want to do is uh, we'll want the callbacks to be using the fat arrow syntax introduced in ECMAScript 6. And what this does is it basically takes care of your this pointer. So you know that inside of a function, this usually refers to the surrounding function. Well, if you use fat arrow syntax, um, and this is the same in ECMAScript 6, it will actually take care of the, this pointer and bind it to the outer context rather than worrying about um, having the inner one. So now all of these things should be hooked up correctly. Now the last thing here is we need to move this down. So I do like having this at the top, but when you have a class, the way that it gets transpiled, it won't exist before that is called if you don't have it at the bottom. So we're going to move that down. Actually, I'm going to stick a curly brace there. And then up at the top, instead of having just an iffy start, we're going to have module. We'll just do a modular, since that's the name of the application. And now it's all happy. So that wasn't a whole lot of changes there, but now this is a class. And what we can do now is whenever we have things like this dot, we now get really good auto completion here. Another thing that you'll notice here is that on our constructor parameters, we have uh, type annotations here for our data service and our logger. I went through and changed all of those services to be using TypeScript classes as well. 
Um, and so that's how those come through. And so when we're when we're doing this dot data service dot, and we get all of the things that we can call in the data service, which is really cool. And it tells us exactly what it's expecting and what we're going to get back, in this case, a promise. OK, so coming down to this thing at the bottom here, Angular. So how does TypeScript help you with Angular? Here we've got Angular dot, and we've got everything we can do with Angular and some more things. Let's see here. It's like we've got module, we've got element, etc. Now that is all possible through this file up here, the angular.d.ts file. Now this is just a normal JavaScript comment, but this is formatted in a special way so that TypeScript knows what files you're trying to reference. And so let's go look at that file, and I can show you a little bit about what's going on there. Sorry, I know we're running over a little bit. Um, get through this really quick, and then I'll let you guys go. Let's see. It's under dot, 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 dot. Oh, it's up a level, I think. OK. So actually, I'm just going to open it directly. Yeah, OK. Let's go into typings, angular.js, angular.d.ts. So this is the definitely type file. And uh, this was created by the community. I'll bet that a lot of it came from the Angular team themselves, but there's probably a lot of other people that were involved as well. But this describes all of Angular. Um, well, not all of it. You can uh, add other modules like the routing and the cookies and things like that to it as well. They have separate d.ts files. But this is where all of our um, auto completion and our uh, documentation is coming from when we are in here. So this helps us out a whole lot. So anyway. Um, I hope this has helped you guys to see how easy it is to use TypeScript. For those of you that want to get started with TypeScript, um, you can go to typescriptlang.org. Or if you're using uh, Node, you can just use npm install g TypeScript. And also check out, check out definitelytype.org for the type definitions. So thank you very much for uh, staying here a little bit late. And does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I just want to thank uh, Russ and Joe for speaking. Those are great talks. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. We are welcome to stick around and mingle. we got to be out of here at 8 o'clock. And uh, thanks. <laughs>